Good morning. Welcome to worship with the people called United Methodist at Chester United Methodist Church, Van Orsdale United Methodist Church, and Big Sandy United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. I'm your pastor, Sue King, and I invite you to uh, sit and relax, put both feet on the ground, and know that you are in holy, on holy grounds wherever you may be, and welcome the presence of God into your life through this worship celebration this morning. Will you join with me in our call to worship? We come here today not because we are clever, but because God welcomes us as new learners. We come here not because we are wise, but because God loves us in spite of our folly. We come knowing that the greatest people will be found among those who humbly serve, like Jesus did. And, among, and that the brightest ideas and the deepest truth will come from those who see themselves as little children in Christ's school. O oh Lord, open our minds and our hearts and enable our lives to declare your praise. Amen. Pray with me, please. New every morning is your love, great God of love. And all day long you are working for good in the world. Stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors and all your creation, and to devote each day to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, our reading is a continuation uh, from the letter of James, in which he wrote to the early Christian communities within about 30 years after the death of Christ. Here he writes from chapter 3 and 4. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also is the tongue a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body. It sets on fire the cycle of nature and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the, Father, the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. 
Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? This is a word from God. Thanks be to God. Just a couple of weeks ago, a friend quoted something to me she'd heard recently. Don't be judges, be fruit inspectors. Well, I kind of wondered who said that, so I decided to Google it, and I never did find the source. But what I did find was a blog by Dr. Bev Smallwood, who is a Christian psychologist and family therapist. Um, her blog was called On the Fallacy of Fruit Inspection. And she points out that this uh, quote is actually a misrepresentation of Matthew 7:13, in which Jesus is warning his disciples against false prophets by when he says uh, those, those false prophets who will do one thing or say one thing but do another. And he says to them, by their fruits you will know them. Well, Dr. Smallwood cautions us against our fruit inspection quote, saying that it's just scripture dressing up actual judgment. And Jesus is pretty clear that he's against judgment. A few verses earlier in Matthew, Jesus says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with judgment, you, for the judgment that you make, you will be judged by that. And the measure that you give will be the measure that you get. Why do you see the speck that is in your neighbor's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own? Well, there's truth in that, isn't there? You know, sometimes it's more comfortable to see what other people are doing wrong and what their faults and their shortcomings are than face our own. Um, on the cover of last month's uh, Upper Room devotional is a painting, a print by Kevin Costley, it's called Stones and Glass Houses. And you can see that Jesus is um, 
bending down and writing in the sand and has a very serious, even stern look on his face. It's a story and all around him are the bodies of people that are holding rocks and stones in their arms and in their hands. It's a story from the gospel according to John chapter eight in which the leaders are testing Jesus. Does he support the law of Moses even when it condones stoning an adulterer to death? They bring before him an accused woman um, and with they have their own stones ready to use at his command. But Jesus bends down and begins writing in the sand and they're waiting. And pretty soon they press him for a judgment. Whoever hasn't sinned, go ahead, throw that first stone, Jesus replies. And one by one, starting with the oldest members in the crowd, they begin to walk away. When all her accusers are gone, Jesus reassures the woman that he does not condemn her either. She can go forward now. She is set free to live her life. Today, the stones that are ready to be, that are being held and are ready to be thrown are words, aren't they? Even at the slightest provocation sometimes, the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Not true at all, is it? What people say, it can build up on, in us. It can tear us down. It can make us feel better, but it also can be used against us. Words that are from a friend or a parent or a teacher uh, can be really positive in our lives. They can stay, it can stay with us for our entire lives, but the same is also true. The harsh words, the critiques can stay with us in our minds as well echoing in our heads as voices that pop up whenever we're frustrated or feeling overwhelmed or tired, for better or worse. If cruel words are hurled at us, it can leave gashes in our minds and in our self-images, whether bullying occurs in person or on social media, it's real. This is one of the reasons that James cautions us about how we use our tongues. What words do we say? Watch what we say to each other. Our words are indeed like fire. It has the power for good or for great harm. We can praise or we can put down. Voices from the past sear words into our minds and it brands our self-image. Words can condemn us to live in misery, or words can empower us to live freely. I'm reading uh, Stanley Gordon West's novel called Blind Your Ponies. It's set in southwestern Montana, in the very real village of Willow Creek, just south of Three Forks on I-90. This fictional story is about a high school basketball coach and team their, uh, and their persistent quest to win a basketball game, even after going four years without a win. With a record of 0 and 87, they are the butt of jokes and ridicule in their, by their conference rivals and in the, most of their community, and sadly, from even a couple of parents one of the school board members is pushing to cancel basketball because they can hardly recruit the five players needed to have a game on the, on the court. Sometimes they're playing four against five or even three against five when they get into foul trouble. The continuous losses are an embarrassment to everyone but their most stalwart fans. But despite their personal dragons, in their lives, the basketball team and the coach keep showing up to play. Now, Coach Sam is a widower who is grieving and traumatized by his wife's death from a mass shooting in a restaurant. As Sam starts his fifth year as a coach, there's only three high school boys who have any experience on the court. Tom Stonebreaker is their forward, who's their star player, He's harassed and even abused by his cruel and alcoholic father. 
He mocks Tom for going to practice and playing his heart out every game. He should be at home working, not embarrassing everyone. Well, Tom's friends and his loyal teammates, Rob and Carter, are more than willing enough players, but they too don't ever expect they're going to win, and their playing kind of lets us know that that's how they feel. Even if they could recruit more players, they're not sure that they would ever win. But then, new prospects emerge. There's Pete, confused and brokenhearted. His parents are getting a divorce, and they've sent him to stay with Grandma in Willow Creek. Plus, he had to leave his girlfriend Kathy behind, and he's not sure that she's going to wait for him. He doesn't know if he belongs to anyone anymore. And he's observed one day shooting free throws outside the school. Swish, swish, one after another. Some excitement begins to stir in a faithful fan who sees this and runs to tell Coach Sam to come and see. Second is Olaf. He is an exchange student from Norway with broken English, and Olaf is a giant, a beanpole of a man, six foot, 10 inches, but he's never played basketball or any sports for that matter. His father's always pushed him into academics, told him that he's clumsy, that he shouldn't waste his time doing sports anyway, something he'd never be good at anyway. Coach Sam recruits Olaf, despite Olaf's doubts and fears of what his father would say if he knew, and all of their preseason lessons are in secret, behind locked gym doors. Olaf has never played a ball, basketball, and he can't bear others' judgments. And he even quits for a while when he hears kids calling him Oaf instead of Olaf. And that echoes like his father's voice in his head, and that with a whispering critique every time he gets a penalty for traveling or breaks the three-second rule in the lane. And lastly, Coach Sam recruits a local boy called Dean. Now, Dean struggles to pass his classes, to stay eligible to play sports. He can't handle a basketball without losing it, but he's fast and he's aggressive on defense. He lives with his mom and his sister, Denise, She's in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy and always attended to constantly by mom. They want to cheer Dan, uh, Dean on, but they can't afford the tickets to even go to the game. When Coach Sam finds out, he gives them complimentary tickets, saying that they always have some laying around. Somebody might as well use them. Well, a team of six boys and a coach desperate to win a basketball game. And at first they continue their losing streak against their conference opponents, but then they win a couple close ones, and then they lose some, but then they start to win again as the tournaments get closer. Hear Coach Sam's words before that first game. Men, we're here to fight the dragon tonight together, but the dragon is not Manhattan Christian, a bunch of hard-working boys just like you with families and girlfriends and pet dogs doing their best to win for their moms and their school and their town. The dragon you face is the voice in your heart that whispers, you are losers. The dragon you face tonight is that fear in your gut that tells you to quit, to give up. It's the softness in your spirit that tempts you to surrender your dreams to lie down and accept defeat politely. Those are the dragons that will rear their ugly heads tonight, the beasts that will beguile us to be something less than what we can be. We're not going out tonight to beat those other boys. We're not, Dean squeaks. No, says Coach Sam. We're going out there to play better than we have ever played before, to play above our God-given talent, harder and higher and longer than we have ever before, to live, not, live life not as it is, but live life as it should be. If we do this, if every one of us does this, then it won't matter if we don't win the game because we will have defeated those dragons. 
But I promise you, men, that if we play that way, we will win the game. Well, I'm not going to tell you how it ends, but I do invite you to order the book because I'm going to do an online book group if you're interested in, in reading uh, Blind Your Ponies uh, by Gordon Stanley West and having some online conversations about it. The truth is this. We all need safe and loving relationships, places where we can hear uh, words that lift us up. And the church ought to be that place. It ought to be a place where we defeat the dragons and the voices of judgment, not add to them. It's the church is a place where we get to win back our lives again when we believe in our own intrinsic worth and discover that we too have God-given talents. As Dr. Bev Smallwood says, people are drawn to love, not condemnation and judgment. Our job is simply to love and accept people as they are because that's what Jesus promised us. Freedom from judgment, acceptance into God's family, and we get to be a part of God's plans because you are you just as God made you and because you are loved. So grateful that you've joined us for worship this morning. We are grateful that you are part of our community, even though we meet together online. I invite you this week to be in prayer with us at the uh, churches, the three churches in Haver, uh, Chester, and Big Sandy. And we will be in prayer with you. Please feel free to contact anyone at the church or any of the churches this week. Um, I would like to be able to be as responsive to our digital worship community as I am our in-person worship community. So this week, may the good Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and may God fill your hearts with peace. Mm -hmm.